So uh, last time we talked about some of the features that you'd need in a sensor network, and one of them was, um, uh, well, uh, a strong energy control. So uh, this is um, this is organized through the coordinators and these uh, sort of leaf devices uh, through a technique called beaconing. And uh, the, uh, the protocol technique that they use is called the super frame. So beaconing and super frames. So generally speaking, let's go back to our um, weather station example. All of these devices, let's say, would be recording the temperature um, over, uh, over a fairly wide area. So we would expect the temperature uh, changes very slowly. So uh, it's probably not necessary for these to be taking hundreds of measurements a second and always communicating their measurements back to the, uh, back to the coordinator. In fact, there's not even, um, so if you took that another level, you could think, OK, these devices don't need, necessarily need to communicate their findings. Uh, they could just uh, measure the temperature hundreds of times a second. And if it changes, send a message. Well, not even that is necessary. We don't expect the temperature will change that fast. In fact, uh, if this is just weather, we don't expect that the temperature will change significantly over a minute, for example. So it would be nice to save energy is for this device to wake up, sense the temperature, uh, transmit that temperature, and then go back to sleep for a minute. And that would, uh, um, that would fit in with one of our mission requirements of a sensor network, which is that it stay alive for a very long period of time. So that would just absolutely minimize the amount of uh, computational energy, sensing energy, and radio energy that we're using. So beaconing and super frames allow us to do that. So we organize time into super frames. Why do they call them super frames? I have no idea. They're just frames. So um, the coordinators send beacon packets. those beacon packets do is that they, they are to uh, mark the beginning of the super frame. What they also do uh, is they specify, they specify two uh, quantities. They specify the super frame duration call that the SD and the beacon interval. one device somewhere in, in the, uh, or, excuse me, uh, that's the dur duration of time in which devices in the pan are allowed to transmit. The beacon interval is uh, because um, beacons mark the beginning of frames, of super frames, uh, the beacon interval is the time between those super frames. So the difference between the beacon interval and the super frame duration is idle. So this is the sleep time. So uh, the super frame is divided as follows. So here's figure two. So at a certain time, 
um, the coordinator transmits a beacon to all of the devices within the personal area network. That sets up the beginning of the super frame. So this is the beacon. And then from then on up to there is the super frame. And this lasts if I um, if I look at how long that is in time, that is SD, the super frame duration. Once the super frame duration is over, there is idle time. So this is inactive time when no device in the network is expected to transmit. So in this time, all of the devices can sleep. And presumably, if you want a, a long-lasting network, this idle time would be much, much, much longer than the super frame duration. So a certain amount of idle time will pass, and then another beacon, which marks the beginning of another super frame. So this is the beacon interval, DI. <coughs> In this range, uh, this is idle time, and no device is permitted to train it during that time. Within the super frame, uh, two things can happen. The first part of the super frame is what's called the uh, contention access period, or CAP. I'll describe that over here. duration of time in which um, devices within the within the personal area network can contend for the uh, uh, can contend for the channel much like in Wi-Fi so uh, this this is the this is the period of time in which you would use something like CSMA if you want in other words devices if they need to transmit will simply examine the channel see if it's free if it's free they'll start transmitting uh, if it's not They'll wait a certain amount of time. They'll wait until it's free, possibly an extra back off, and then transmit. Um, so, in other words, this is this is a, this is a, a free access time. Over here, this is called uh, the other part of this frame is called the uh, contention free period (CFP). This is actually divided into time slots that are guaranteed to certain users. This is uh, division of time into guaranteed time slots. Like TDM. In fact, this period of time here, so while this period of time here is like Wi-Fi, in other words, any user that wants to transmit can, this period of time here is more like Bluetooth. So in Bluetooth, we had that um, uh, devices were specifically allocated certain periods of time in which they were allowed to transmit, and that's what this is here. So they're not, uh, if a device negotiates with the coordinator and obtains one of these uh, guaranteed times, one of these guaranteed time slots, uh, they need not, Contend with anyone else for that time slot. That's their time slot to use. 